her to have Maggie here at the podium. She's somebody I've kind of admired from afar. You know, she's seen me and I've seen her and we haven't really taken time to get acquainted. And so recently we've had a lunch and, you know, mm -hmm. chit-chatted a little bit and gone, hmm, wow, isn't this interesting? And we've had some great laughs and fun and we kind of, at the new moon, opened the vortex for this uh, right. gathering this weekend. And uh, I'm telling you, she's, she's a certifiable goddess here. She's the real deal. <laughs> uh, got the goods. Uh, I'm taking, I'm into her time, but I'll tell you her mission is at the retreat center. She operates a great wedding venue. If you care to get married, it's a good place. Uh, and she's exploring consciousness and the healing power of the mind. And uh, it's a beautiful place. I finally, after a decade, found my way over there to admire it. And she was kind enough to, to reciprocate. And so with no further words, I'm going to give you the awesome Maggie McElvain. And Thank you, uh, she will be out. <laughs> Wow, what a beautiful introduction. And welcome everybody. And what an incredible gift that we can be on top of a mountain to talk about the heart and to be in the heart together and to listen to that incredible music. Wasn't that amazing? Yeah. It's incredible, woohoo! So, just gonna get a few things here. And I have a little treat. Is that okay? Can you hear me okay? Great. I feel that we are at a time now that we are really returning to the divine feminine and coming into our hearts and being in that energy and what a beautiful gift it is, we said, to be on this mountain and come into that place. It's so important to know that in this crazy time with all these things happening in the world that we have this opportunity to create this vibration and this frequency and this oneness and connectedness to do that. So I'm so grateful to be here. And I think it's gonna be an incredible, amazing weekend for us to unify together and enjoy. I was here last night and we were preparing for everything, and on the way home, I had an inspiration to buy some roses. And um, I would like to pass these around and have everybody just pick a petal. And you'll get the significance of this in a bit. So when I went home last night, um, I did a little bit of research about roses. And they say that roses are the lotus flower of the West. And that in Hindu Ayurvedic medicine, that people take roses to balance the heart. And we know that roses are healing on many, many levels for us. But it was just so beautiful and interesting to see that, yes, it's for balancing the heart. So please take one and pass that on. So again, this, this theme of homecoming is journey into the heart and living the message of love. There's something that I heard the other day after talking with somebody about some current events in the world and the crazy things that are happening. And they said, you know, have we lost our minds? And the other person said, no, I don't think we've lost our minds. We've lost our hearts. And I don't really feel that, you know, we've lost our hearts, but it's such a time for the message of love to come back. And they say that in the 20th century, that was the century of the brain but the 21st century is the century of the heart. So let's all take a nice deep breath <laughs> and connect into that. So again, I feel it's the return of the divine feminine balanced with the divine masculine. And this is such an opportunity to really live from that place. And I imagine so many of us in this room, we've journeyed into the heart and out of the heart and into the heart and out of the heart and back and forth many times. And I know that so many of us are, are on a spiritual path. We're learning to journey into the heart and stay there longer and anchor there longer. So I am here today to tell you about my personal journey about more heart-centered consciousness and different teachings I've had along the way that have really assisted to help me anchor into more heart-centered consciousness. I'd like to share the beautiful, magical parts of that journey, and then there's some difficult parts of that journey, um, like from separation into wholeness, coming from mind into the heart, 
and I run a healing um, practice at my retreat center. And I have three, three stories to tell you about clients that I was working with there that really kind of wove this journey um, of the journey into the heart and um, that brings so much freedom from feeling like I was just having such a difficult time piercing through into my own heart to opening that, opening that vortex of limitlessness. But before I begin, let's just take a moment for all of us just to drop our consciousness into our hearts. So if you could just close your eyes for a moment and ah, take a nice deep breath and begin to strengthen that precious connection. Just taking a pause to feel into your heart. Taking some in-breaths in there to stop and connect from the busyness of getting here. We're just connecting together as a group. Beautiful. Another nice deep breath and then just slowly coming back. It's amazing what a few moments of mindfulness or awareness will do. Well, I'd like to begin right now to start by going through some information that's out there about the physical heart from a, like a left brain perspective, because we're speaking about the spiritual heart so much. And then there's, I was just interested to see, well, let me get some information about the physical heart. Um, so this is definitely from a left brain perspective here. So I learned that every day your heart beats 100,000 times and it sends 2,000 gallons of blood that surges through your body, which to me is just like unthinkable. And then it says, you know, of course, it's no bigger than your fist. And um, it has this amazing job of keeping all our blood flowing through, and this makes absolutely no sense to me, 60,000 miles of blood vessels. I can't really imagine that. But however, it's, as we know, it's no longer thought of as just this pump for the blood. It's a profound organ of intelligence, intuition, and it creates an energetic connection between all things. We've spoken about heart math here a few, for a few times. There was a wonderful speaker here a couple years ago um, who's helped start heart math. And um, heart math is in Boulder Creek, California. And they have discovered that the heart has its own brain, and there's actually 40,000 cells in the heart that are like brain cells. And it's said that our heart communicates to every other heart electromagnetically through these different pulses. And every beat sends out an electromagnetic 360-degree spherical bubble at the speed of light. That also makes no sense to me. <laughs> but it's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> Also at HeartMath, they've proven that the heart generates the largest and most profound energy field of any organ in the body. And this electromagnetic field is like um, 8 to 10 feet from our body, and, it, and the axis is centered in the heart, and its shape represents a torus. So we're actually all always immersed in each other's heart field. And there's, there's so much more about it. They say that the, the source of the heartbeat is actually in the heart and not the brain. And when they do a heart transplant, they can't connect the heart actually with the brain. And the heart it just beats on its own. For example, there is this study where they had a Petri dish and they put different people's heart cells in the Petri dish. And after a while, all the hearts were beating at the same time. They did the same thing with brain cells of different people. And the brain cells, <laughs> I see his head going like this, the brain cells did not connect and they then they died. The heart sends much more information to the brain than the brain does to the heart. And uh, interestingly enough, when you think about the it, conception, when a baby is conceived, um, the heart actually begins to beat before the brain is formed. And this has led doctors to wonder, like, where is the intelligence coming that would have the heart beat first? In utero, both the heart and the brain emerge from the same set of cells, which is the neural tube. It's, um, and then when a child is born, the mother's heart entrains the child's system. And so I know that some of you who studied about the way children are born and how important it is to allow the child to lay on the mother for 20, 
you know, it's 40 minutes before they're then taken away and cleaned. And so it's essential because the baby's heart is in training to the mother's heart, which then organizes the whole baby system. Little by little, some hospitals are beginning to um, wake up to this because it's profoundly important. And all of this really lends so much authenticity to, for centuries and centuries, writers and poets and, you know, many Native Americans and Native peoples have spoken about the intelligence of the heart. And there's this wonderful book that I'm reading called The Courage, Lessons in Courage. And it says Native Americans and Inuits and Aboriginals, they're really kind of surprised and wondering at the tardy appearance of Western science's interest in about the heart and heart intelligence because they take that just for common sense. A little bit behind there. However, none of these experiences and none of these amazing pieces of information that I'm sharing with you fully prepared me for this very unusual experience that I had eight years ago, which really assisted me on my own connection with my own heart. And I feel that one can know something, we can know these facts and read about them and talk about them, but until we have like a felt sense somatic experience in our body about this, it doesn't really, really come to life. So what happened to me was that I accompanied a client who um, invited me to go to open heart surgery with her. And um, I would like to share what occurred when I was in heart surgery with her. It just changed my life, really. But before I share that, I need to kind of back up a little bit and give you some background. Back in 1997, um, I attended the Barbara Brennan School of Healing. Have any of you ever heard about the Barbara Brennan? Okay, great, some, some haven't here. Um, for, any, for those of you who don't know who she was, she was a gifted intuitive and an astrophysicist who was just extraordinary in her ability to see the energy field and work with the energy field and do amazing work with people. So she started a four-year program called the Barbara Brennan School of Healing, and I studied there. And um, when I finished the training, I began working with a client who had breast cancer. And um, Barbara Brennan, it's, so she actually had breast cancer eight years before that. And then she really wanted me to kind of assist her to prepare for the surgery and go through some healing issues that she had around lack of nurturance, lack of self-worth, difficult you know, relationships with her family and early childhood. And I was so grateful to have this opportunity because when I was at the Barbara Brennan School of Healing, Barbara Brennan had a vision of energetic healers working alongside surgeons and how important that would be to really balance those two. And I really took in my, into myself that, mess, that message and that dream because it balances Western medicine and Eastern medicine. It balances the, you know, the intuitive side of how we heal and then the medical side, and both of them are so valid. And I think it's a, it really creates this wonderful wholeness when they're really working together. So I was very enthusiastic about this and very excited to be able to do this. And so um, I hope this is, yeah, this is still completely my dream. So anyway, like I said, the client had breast cancer nine years earlier and she had one of her breasts removed. She went through a deep depression, it was very sad, and it took her a long time to recover. So she wanted to do this in a different way. So we prepared for the surgery, we did numerous sessions, she got permission from UVA to allow me to go in with her, which was pretty extraordinary and almost miraculous. And I acted in a way as like her energetic support system. And um, I remember, I told, you know, we were working with her chakra system and her energy field and, you know, allowing her to feel that she's supported and safe. And I remember when they gave her the anesthesia, her her entire field just collapsed. And I remember when that occurred, as my first time in surgery, I thought, where did she go? What am I supposed to work with now? Like the, the energy field just completely disappeared. <laughs> and as I sort of tuned in and I'm working intuitively, I looked up and I saw she'd left her body and she had gone up, you know, was floating above her body, as some people do when they're in a traumatic situation. And I was able to find her and connect with her energetically, keep her safe and, the surgery was extraordinarily successful, 
and she, I think, left uh, five hours after the surgery, didn't have any depression, took like three aspirins or something. It was extraordinary that it, it was so different than the first one. So we actually um, were invited to give a talk at um, Virginia Beach to these nurses and these doctors, and this was like in 1997. And, um, I was a little mortified. I mean, I get nervous when I have to do public speaking anyway, but this was really mortifying because <laughs> you could feel the skeptical skepticism in the room because I'm talking about her energy field and that she floated out of the body. <laughs> and all these eyes are just rolling and I'm thinking, oh my God, I think I'm gonna faint right in the spot. <laughs> and then when I was explaining the part that, um, yes, and then you know the, the anesthesia came and her field just completely collapsed and there was this anesthesiologist in the very back of the room and he said, that's right, that's exactly what happens. We bring them on the, on the brink of death. And I thought, oh, credibility, thank God. <laughs> because I, I could feel some of the rest of the people were looking at me with such weird eyes and I think they, were, they thought I was working with the devil or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is a whole other story, another talk. So anyway, also from 2002 to 2008, I also attended surgeries with children with facial deformities. When I was working um, in Hawaii at a place called the World Healing Institute, and they were um, working with Operation Smile, and we'd bring children over from the Philippines who had pretty severe um, deformities on their faces. So since I was on the board of directors, I got to go into the surgery there. And that was, again, extraordinarily intense, but um, a very powerful experience. And energetically, what happens to people when they're in surgery and all the medications and all the anesthesia, their energy field gets, it gets like put in a blender. So um, it was, it was, I was fine doing that and it was very helpful to, to be there, but it was, um, it was really a wonderful experience as well. But now I would like to move to the part where I told you I was invited to go to heart surgery with this woman. And um, this is really, I think, one of the biggest things that assisted me to pierce into my own heart. A client of mine had been coming to see me um, for a while and she really needed to have energy support while she had this surgery for her, for her heart at UVA. She needed to have her um, mitral valve replaced. And um, what a mitral valve is, is that um, when oxygen comes from the lungs into the left atrium, it passes through this valve, the mitral valve, into the left ventricle. And then that's the heart's, that's the left ventricle is the heart's main pumping center. So then when the left ventricle contracts, the mitral valve closes. Hers wasn't working. So they had to take out this valve and put in another one. So while I knew that this would be an extraordinarily intense experience, I assumed it would pretty much be like the other ones that I had attended. And she'd gotten permission from her doctor, who is one of the top heart specialists in the country, who was now at UVA. And again, I was really amazed that he even allowed me to um, be there, but he certainly did. And on the day of the surgery, I met her early in the morning, and I was able to be by her side the entire time. And she was, I told her that I would be working with her energetically and monitoring her field and supporting her chakra system, you know, as I had done in the other surgeries. So we were taken into the surgery and she was given anesthesia and I was prepared for what was gonna happen with that now. And um, it became pretty intense because, um, you know, they have to break your breastbone. So they broke the breastbone and then they have to, um, hold the um, breastbone open with like these two huge iron bars. So it's just really a difficult thing on some level to see. And I'm standing right here, her head is here. And so her you know, openness is right there, just to give you a sense of that. Um, so yeah, it's just like a foot away. So that was really intense. And I, I had the feeling that I was really seeing something intensely personal deeply, deeply personal because the heart was there and it's beating and it's exposed. And I really felt like some privacy had been terribly invaded to have the heart exposed like that. 
And those in the operating room, the doctors and the nurses, kept looking at me and asking me if I was okay, sure that I would topple over and faint at any moment. <laughs> but I was calm, and I felt strangely calm, and how important and, and strong, how important it would be for me to keep that, that energy. So I watched every moment, and I kept being with her spirit and monitoring her field, supporting it with my own, allowing my resonant field to assist her resonant field. And I remembered a story that Sachidananda from Sachidananda's ashram, he was at UVA with Dr. Dean Ornish, and they were giving a talk about um, heart health and diet. And um, Dr. Dean Ornish was speaking to all these doctors about how important it is to, say, to you know, change your diet for your heart health. And the doctors in the room all said, that's just too radical. That's ridiculous. You can't do that. Tell, tell people to change their diet. And Sajidananda sat up and said, stood up and said, oh, and breaking the breastbone and bringing this open and doing that is not radical. That's radical. <laughs> it's a great point. And me being there and watching that, I realized that is extraordinary. It's very radical. And it's wonderful they were able to do that because it helped her, but it was extraordinarily radical. So things are going along slowly. And then the surgeon looked over at me and he said, we're preparing to shift her over to life support because they needed to do that for, to, to do the work on the May 12 valve. And I was really grateful that you know, he kept me informed of what they were doing and they were quite respectful of my presence. But it's here, at this moment, that this really extraordinary thing occurred. And it's, it was my experience, so I hope so much that I can convey it well to you. Moments, or even seconds before he did the shift over to the life support system, I'm standing there and I'm doing my thing, and I suddenly felt the energy of her heart reach out in fear and ask for support to my heart. And it seemed like it asked for this, you know, protection and like a, 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 to be embraced. And my heart responded with this extraordinary feeling like what felt like an embrace. This comforting, shielding embrace. And I sensed that these two hearts were communicating while I'm watching. I'm watching this. And I'm like, doing like this. <laughs> who's, who's talking? I'm not part of the conversation. And I, or the me that was watching, was totally bypassed. And I was wondering, who's communicating if I'm not communicating? <laughs> and then they're making some kind of arrangement together. And, and I could feel it, but I couldn't understand the language. But I could, I could really sense it was profound. And that I almost needed to get out of the way and let them just do what they were doing, because I'd probably interfere with it on some level. But it was like my heart was going to do for her heart what I have been always doing energetically for people in surgeries. So this was also way in beyond, above and beyond even that, because these two hearts bonded in a way that I will never, ever, ever forget. And it really it brought tears to my eyes. The depth and the love and the connectedness was the most profound part. It was just absolutely extraordinary. And I remember looking at the clock when all this was going on, and it was 10.35 a.m. So the bonding in this manner between my heart and my client's heart continued for the next two and a half hours or for however long the surgery went on. And my job now became to just support that. You know, like in the other surgeries, I'm checking the different levels of the field and which chakra's being affected and all of that. None of that anymore. It was just stay here and be present with this. So two hours later, the surgery was complete, and I went to the waiting room to tell her family and her boyfriend that, you know, everything was fine, and, you know, I'm talking with her mom and like this, and she's good, and I went and I hugged her boyfriend, and he would not stop hugging me. And he was so emotional, and he just was, and he's not a very emotional person. And he said, I thought we lost her. I thought something terrible happened. And I just felt this horrible tugging on my heart. And, and is, is she really okay? And, she was, and I, said, I told him, of course, it was okay. And I said, you know, John, what, what time was that? Or do you have any recollection about that time it was? And as you would have it, 
it was 1035, which I felt was extraordinary because I think her heart, again, that feel that we were talking about, reached out to people that she loved and those who were sensitive enough to feel it, he got it. And so her heart, I bet chills everywhere, her heart really just completely reached out to the one he loved, as we all do with people we love. And, and then people that we're not you know, getting along with, you can feel that too. And that's what heartbreak is. And it's communicating all the time. So I told him, I have a story to share with you. <laughs> After all of this, I wait to hear what happened to me while I was in the operating room. So like people who are um, you know, profoundly affected by near-death experiences, and their lives are never the same because they go to a level or dimension you know, where they've never touched before and then they come back here. This was like my close encounter with the heart, close encounter with heart energy, the heart intelligence, the heart field, and the love. And it was really absolutely incredible. I'm gonna have a drink. <laughs> So, some of you may have heard a book um, called The Heart's Code by Dr. Purcell. Anybody hear about that book? Just a few. Um, it is a fascinating account of um, research of heart transplant patients who were receiving memories from their donors, like about food and places and music and that type of thing. And they start, these people who received these hearts started to kind of take on the personality of the donor in some way. Like the cellular memory carries over to the recipient. So for example, there was a lawyer in one of the accounts who um, received a heart from a fellow who had a motorcycle accident. And after he came home, he started craving beer and cigarettes. <laughs> And he said that his wife would find him like outside on the back porch, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and he didn't know, but he really, wa he really wanted it. <laughs> I love that story. Um, and then there's another one. Um, this is not as, as amusing. Um, a little girl received a heart from someone. And um, after she got home, she had nightmares almost every night. And she was seeing this face. This, this face kept coming towards her. And, it, and then she couldn't breathe. So this went over and over and over. And finally, the mother decided to do some research. Like, where, where is this coming from? Anyway, they called someone in. And they were able to like draw a picture of what the face was. And, and it, they, she asked, where did she get the heart? And the little girl's heart that she got had been murdered. And they actually with this face and with these stories and with the, me the memories from this heart, they found the man and they convicted him. True story. Isn't that wild? I know. And the last one I'd like to share is from a book from, uh, by Claire Sylvia called Change of Heart. And this was back in 1988 and she had a pioneering heart lung transplant. And she'd been given the organ of an eight year-old boy who'd been killed in another motorcycle accident, but uh, he didn't drink and smoke, actually, in this case. But um, she ended up having so many different kind of changes happen in her life, and memories, and food, and music. The whole, a lot of it was about music, um, that she began to research to see who it was that she found that she got the heart from, and she was able to get that information. And usually you can't do this because of a um, privacy act, but somehow she was able to find the donor's family. And it was in Maine, and she, she traveled up there, and she met the family, and she started sharing these stories with them because it was so perplexing what was occurring to her. And her family, they said in this story, after many, many tears and then laughter because it was almost like they were sitting with the sun again, and they really confirmed this is what had been occurring. And so... Once the heart's in there, I don't know how you end, clear, end up clearing some of these memories, but there's a great book called um, 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 Hands of Life, not Hands of Light, that's Barbara Brennan's book, but Hands of Light, Life, and Judy Motz is an energetic healer, and her main job is to, you know this, her main job is to clear the energy field of organs that are going to be put into other people. 
which after reading this, reading about this other material and researching for this talk, I thought that's so that's such an important idea for the soul that's left. I mean, I'm not sure how that affects that spirit, right? You know, and certainly for the one that's coming into. So yes, it's pretty pretty extraordinary. So moving on to the next part. On my journey to freedom and coming into my heart-centered consciousness, and with all this information, I made a decision that I wanted to connect with my own heart the way that my heart connected with my client's heart in heart surgery. Because I felt that I, this is a very personal story in a way I can't believe I'm sitting here telling you all this, but, but I couldn't do it. I mean, I could only kind of get so far. But I wanted to learn how to do that with that, that authenticity and that trust and that essence of self. I wanted to do it with myself. I did that with her heart, and then I felt if I can do this with myself, then I can do this with others in a more profound way. But every time I tried doing that, you know, with myself or with others, I'd go so far and I'd do my meditations, I'd do this, and I felt like I would come to this impenetrable wall. And no matter what I did, I could not get through that wall. And I'd try again and, you know, breathe more and come in, but it just, I couldn't get through. Drunvalo Melchizedek, I'm sure many of you have heard of him in this, in this room, he, he has a wonderful book called Living from the Heart. And he talks about a meditation that he does to guide people into their hearts. And he does this with huge groups of people. And he, in his talk, he was saying that nearly 50% of the people, when he does this meditation, they can get into their heart. They pierce right in, they go to that sacred inner chamber, they have this change of perception, and it's fantastic. 50% people can't. They just can't do it. So he said that um, he realized that the pain that we feel around our heart can keep us out. And those who have experienced emotional trauma at some time, which we all have, and have not cleared it in their, in their hearts and in their lives, the pain then, they feel that pain again when they attempt to enter that sacred space and they want to leave immediately, or automatically, or even unconsciously. They just can't get through it. So I felt that I wasn't brave or skilled enough at that time to pierce through the pain that I had around my own heart. You know, we all have some pain around our hearts. That line of communication is so much more open now after that experience with surgery, and you know, many 10-day silent retreats, and that type of thing. Yet in, in relationships, I couldn't do that. And um, the more someone loved me, the, the more frightened I became. So I have a very, very silly self-effacing story to tell you that's a perfect example <laughs> and illustration of that. <laughs> I was living in San Francisco years ago, and um, I was seeing someone, and we were out for dinner at my favorite place um, right by Ocean Beach, if you know San Francisco. And it's this lovely place, and it's great food, and you can see the ocean, and you know, we're sitting there having this wonderful dinner, and just, it was great, it was a lovely evening. And suddenly he said, oh, I have something for you. And I thought, oh, you know, it's like tickets to a play, <laughs> you know, or, or something. And so I, you know, kept eating, and all of a sudden, he, he pulls out this little thing from his pocket, and it's a gray box, small. <laughs> And I remember I looked in my, like all the blood drained from my face. <laughs> and my heart started to go, and, and, and you could see the look on his face, like, oh, this is like this big moment. I'm thinking, oh my God. And it was like a grenade, a ticking time bomb. And it like slowly made its way across the table. <laughs> and I'm getting more and more panicked, and he's like, the more it closes to me, he's getting excited about it. I'm thinking, oh my God, help me. And so by the time it gets to my this is, I can't believe I'm telling you all this. By the time it gets to my you know, side of the table, I was in a panic. I stood up. I have to go. I have to leave. I have to go now. And he's like, what? What's wrong? I can't talk about it. <laughs> and I ran outside to the parking lot. And it was horrible. And he came out later. And he's like, what is up with you? And, and it turned out it was this lovely moonstone ring. It was not a diamond. <laughs> So, so that was really a good part. And then we were able to talk about it, and we cleared it up, and then there was, it was like a standing joke between us. Anytime he came over, he'd say, I have a present for you. It's not a ring. It's not a ring. 
So clearly, I had some work to do. <laughs> Can't believe I'm telling this to my own community. Whatever. So on, continuing on, life so often sends us exactly what we need. And I clearly needed something. And I feel that my heart and my spirit really called this next piece in. It was just truly magical. Two years ago, another client, my last client, coming to the end here, um, she was very serious about her awakening to her heart and her journey basically to enlightenment. She had done extraordinary work in her life and um, she came to see me every two weeks. She was doing absolutely profound work. And with my skill, I could track her, you know, while we're doing our healing session. I could, t you know, tune in with her and then track to see where she is and how things are. And then I'd share that with her. And she said, this is so wonderful because you give me so much validation of how my spiritual practices are affecting me. So honestly, I wondered why she was coming to me because I learned so much more from her, I felt. So I see in pictures when I do my work and I'd like to share one of these visions that I saw one time when we were working together. And there was a huge round circle and doors are surrounding in their circle. And I saw her standing in front of the door, like with her hands, you know, down like that. There's no lock and there's no doorknob or anything like this, but she's just standing in front of each of these doors. And then she's calibrating her heart to a certain frequency in order to open the door. That's the only way that it would open. Then she'd move to the next door and she would do the, certain, the, the same thing and get to a certain level of consciousness with connecting to her heart and the door would open. And around and around and around she went. And it was very clear that it was her ability to be in her heart that would actually open that door. And outside this round circle, there were just, it was like stars in the universe or something. And I could see that, you know, that's what was happening and how she did this. So after the session, I said, I should be paying you <laughs> instead of you paying me because I learned so much and that was an extraordinary experience. And um, she reminded me of what Drunvalo also said, you are much more than a human being. Within your heart is a place, a sacred place where the world can literally be remade through conscious co-creation. Life knows when a spirit is born into the higher levels, and life will use you as all the great masters who have ever lived have been used, and your life will become a life of service to humanity, and hers really indeed is. So I then asked her who she was studying with, who her teacher was, how she's learning to do this. I really wanted to learn to do this. And she told me that she'd been working with this woman from British Columbia named Myrna Martin, who does something called process workshops with only seven people in this group. And it's a very deep, heart-opening work that also assists to change like neurological pathways in your brain. And Myrna's teacher is a man named Dr. Ray Castellino, she explained. Well, I was absolutely shocked, and my mouth just totally dropped open because the most astonishing thing was that that very morning this woman named Kate had brought to my center a woman from British Columbia to see if she wanted to do workshops at my house and her name was Myrna Martin. <laughs> I'm not kidding. She was sitting in my living room two hours before I did that session. So I thought that was pretty incredible. And I said, needless to say, needless to say, I, I signed up for those process workshops. <laughs> and it, it profoundly changed my life. And all who I'm connected to. And I think it's really given me the courage to even be here today and talk about this. In brief, what occurs is that each person has a turn that can last up to two hours. And there's just seven people. And at the end, each person's journey is extraordinarily profound because it's a journey into their heart, which can be hard, very hard. And um, let's see, I had gotten so much from being a support to others that 
you know, I actually thought that I didn't need a turn because <laughs> I, I was the last one because it was, I didn't want to go first. So I really literally almost drove by and thought, everybody will be so glad, they get to go home, I won't have to have my turn. But anyway, I did, I did do that, obviously. <laughs> and um, three and a half hours later, my turn for three and a half hours, um, I was totally transformed because with this support and the love of these people, I was able to pierce through these layers of pain in my heart and it was a journey I never really even thought was possible. So I felt a profound shift in my, in my frequency and a very deep slowing down. I usually can get pretty speeded up to stay away from things. It was a much more slow, the world felt different. It's like the saying, all healing is a shift in perception. And I had even more compassion for others than I usually I do. But the most important thing is I began to have true compassion for myself. That was the key point. So I signed up for Myrna's um, year-long training. And she's now doing the advanced training at my house. So any of you want any information about that, I highly recommend it. <laughs> so a few days after that, on my, you know, again, journey to living in this way and living in the heart and living in freedom, I did a very, very courageous thing. And by the way, um, courage, the word courage is, is a heart word. Some of you may know this. The root of the word courage is cur. It's the Latin word for heart. And in one of its mm, earliest uh, definitions, courage, means to speak one's mind by telling all of one's heart. Isn't that nice? to speak one's mind by telling all of one's heart. So my action that I was able to do with this courage was I made a fateful phone call to speak from the heart. I had had a, a break with somebody I loved very, very much who um, helped me start my healing center, actually. And we had had such an amazing spiritual connection, and it was devastatingly painful for both of us. So with an open heart and some trepidation, needless to say, I made this call and we talked and we stayed in, in being, you know, really being with each other. And at the end of the talk, she said, Maggie, this feels like the first time we've ever talked. So we had healed our rift. And because of that reuniting, we resumed our spiritual work together along with a woman that we've already worked with previously in England named Gabriella Kaffer, who's a wonderful sound healer some of you may know. We'd taken groups, spirit groups on a spiritual tours to North Carolina, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Pennsylvania, of course, Virginia, Scotland, and England. And the way that we work is that we tune in together and ask for guidance about what we need to teach and where we need to go. And we do this on the phone mostly, and sometimes it takes about nine months to prepare. So we were extraordinarily overjoyed to be able to work together again. So what occurred next is that Gabriella had come over from England, and she was giving a sound healing concert at my center. And we were preparing for this concert, and she had a really bad cold that night. And so she, you know, last minute things, and everybody's coming, and she goes, oh, we don't have an altar. We have to make an altar. <laughs> Candle, flowers, and... This statue, this is a statue of the sleeping goddess from Malta. It's all her fault. The rest of the story is all her fault. <laughs> so we put this up. I'm going to put her back down here for a minute. <laughs> so, um, so interestingly enough, this, the, the concert went well. She made it through, but she really, you know, by the end of the night, we went up in my kitchen and made her some hot tea and that kind of thing. And we were so amazed because everybody was happy about the concert, but they really loved the altar. <laughs> like, that was the most beautiful, simple altar. Beautiful, powerful. And so, again, they um, were saying, where's the statue from? And like I said, this is the statue from um, Malta. Where are these pictures? And they, this statue is of the sleeping goddess who dreams the world into being. And it was found in the hypogeum in Malta. And I'd like to pass these around for you to see. 
Diane left this statue at my center at a whole other gathering, and I called her to say that she left it, and she said, oh, no, I didn't leave it. I, I, gave, I gifted it to the center. And she's been to Malta many, many times and is going again next week, as a matter of fact. And she'll be giving a talk on that at my house in a few months. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Oh, uh, boy. So, <laughs> so afterwards, as I said, we were um, in the kitchen, and we were talking about it. And for a minute, we felt such a powerful feeling come upon us. And we stopped talking, and we all we tuned in. And it's Gabrielle and Terry and I. And after we kind of opened our eyes, we looked at each other, and we said, we have to go to Malta. And then right after we said that, we went, where's Malta? <laughs> Does anybody here know where Malta? I had no idea where Malta was. <laughs> it's 100 miles south of Sicily. But we didn't care where it was. We were going to go. <laughs> we were going to go anyway. So it turned out that the theme of the work and going to Malta was all about the heart. And I will read you two pieces from our, what our tune-ins, one of our tune-ins. We were told that the most important thing to share was the unveiling of the layers that had been placed upon the mother, the heart, the divine feminine, the message that came over and over was about the heart, harmony, cohesion, and coherence. Then I heard from my piece, the heart is a bomb of light assisting to mend the fragmented pieces and join them back together. Each participant is to create this within themselves and then from that place join the whole. And Gabriella received, each member holds a very specific energy signature that put together in this coherent field of heart-centered consciousness can unlock and activate a particular frequency portal that can anchor a new grid of peace, harmony, cooperation, healing, co-creation, health in the communities and earth, and codes for the new culture. So this trip to Malta was with, without question a highlight of my life. And those of you who know me know that I travel quite a bit. There are more Neolithic sites in Malta than all of Europe combined. And we were guided which temples to go to, what to do with to each, what to do with our hearts, how to hold this heart connection as a whole group. That was the most important thing. I gave a talk about this at Chrysalis. It's on my website if you ever want to hear it. And I mentioned at the beginning here about the roses and how they balance the heart. And they are associated with the goddess and her love and they are associated with the, pres you know, with the love that, that is evoked in our hearts from that. In the 12th century from France, um, the rose was the symbol of newly emerging feminine principle. So the last story I'd like to share reflects the magic of this journey and opening the heart. Terry and I were flying to Malta. We went to Frankfurt. We're on the plane. We're getting off to change and we go through first class to get off the plane. And I turned around because Terry wasn't there, and the stewardess was getting a red rose to give to her. And I thought, how lovely, that's, in, you know, that's, that's wonderful that she's being given a red rose. And then when I turned around, they grabbed one for me, and we thought, oh, it's just because we're the last two going through first class. But when we got off the plane, nobody else had roses. We were given these roses. And there's a whole story of what we were able to be guided to do with those roses and how we work with them in meditation and we put them on our altar and put them in water. So you each have a petal now. So however you want to work with that petal to bring you into more heart-centered consciousness, I welcome you to do that. And the last thing I'd like to share is that life really brought forth a series of events that invited me to journey deeper into the heart. And because of this, a whole vista opened. And my relationships changed. My family relationships changed. My, self, my relationships with myself changed. And they're not perfect, but they're definitely much better. And when I get activated, which of course I still do, I can better monitor it and slow down and stop and be at a very different frequency. And kind of allow that energy to settle in that, uh, that allows me to be acting from kindness much more than reaction. 
So I look back on all of this and see it as a divine flow. And um, each step along the way, something opened. Another step, another something opened. So I want to thank you very much for allowing me to share my journey with you. And there is something called a heart flame meditation that um, I, will, I have on my website if you would like to read that. So thank you very much. <laughs>